Take your Bibles. We're going to continue on in the book of Jonah this morning. Go ahead and turn to the very first verse of the book of Jonah. It's been a while since we've looked at Jonah, so I wanted to kind of get us reoriented where we're at in Jonah. So let's just read all of the first chapter, and then we're going to continue on this morning in chapter 2. So Jonah, chapter 1, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you are sleeping? Get up. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, Come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell to Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us now on whose account has this calamity struck us. What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not. For the sea was becoming even stormier against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life, and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. And then our section this morning, chapter 2, then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. And he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord. And he answered me, I cried for help from the depth of Sheol. You heard my voice. For you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death, the great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever. But you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. 
Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. As I was thinking about this text, I came to the realization that the relationship between parents and children is not all that different than the relationship between God and Christians, God and God's children. There's a lot of overlap between the two. As parents, you have wisdom that exceeds that of your kids, despite what they think. You know what behaviors will lead to good outcomes. You know the things they need to do for their life to turn out good. And you also know what they should avoid and not do so that their life would not turn out bad. Often, if you're a parent, you're like Solomon in the Proverbs, pleading with his son, listen to me. Don't go down that path that ends in death and destruction. Instead, go down the wise path. That which leads to a better outcome. You forbid your children from doing certain things, and when your child does those things, presumably they get disciplined, and you make your rules, and often your kids don't understand those rules. They don't know why you would set up such a rule or guardrail. You ask things of them they don't like. Now, why is that is the question. Why do you do that as a parent? Why do you set up guardrails for your kid? Is it because you don't like your kid? No. You love your kid. That's not even a question in your head. You want what's best for your kid. You set up boundaries and rules because you just want what is right. You want their life to have a peaceful outcome. God and God's children are not that much different. In this respect, God, through his word and instruction, tells us what his will is for us. And God, being infinitely wiser, knows that the best place to be for his glory and for our good is under his will, in the center of his will. And when God's children get out of line, he goes to the great measure, goes to great measures, to great extents, for the sole purpose of realigning us with his will. And that is often through much difficulty. And our guy Jonah that we've been talking about has experienced this very thing. If you recall back last time I talked about Jonah, in Jonah chapter 1, Jonah begins this story as we just read by getting a call from God, get up, go to Tarshish, proclaim to them their sin. But did Jonah obey? Of course not. Jonah fled. Went, uh, did I say Tarshish? I meant Nineveh. Go to Nineveh. Proclaim to Nineveh their sin. But he got up. He went to Tarshish, disobeyed the Lord, got on the boat to Tarshish, and the storm is hurled upon this ship. He knows it's from God. It says that God threw and hurled this storm, this great wind on the ship, where it nearly capsizes. His crew members are panicking in this moment. He's sound asleep. He's numb to his sin. He's numb to the fact that he's already disobeyed God. And so the storm increases and he ends up being at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea. Chapter one culminates in Jonah being tossed overboard by the sailors, almost willingly it seems, if you read the text. And God appointed a great fish Maybe a whale, doesn't say whale, but we can, I mean, what other fish could fit a man, but something like a whale. But a great fish swallowed Jonah in an act of mercy. Remember, that is an act of mercy on God's part. That is, Jonah doesn't view that as God's judgment. The whale is provision for Jonah to keep living, as we're going to see. And God, not out of a desire to inflict meaningless punishment, not out of that desire, but out of love and compassion has not stood silently by as he watches his servant, as he watches his prophet 
run into sin and turn a blind eye to him. You'll remember that I say over and over as we talk about Jonah, this is a book not just about a great fish that swallows a man. That's a wonderful story. It's a great Sunday school story. It's something we should all know. It's, but, but the main point of the book of Jonah is about God's compassion. At every turn in the book of Jonah, that's what it's about. It's about God being a compassionate, long-suffering, gracious God. And that is why he does what he does. That's why he acts in the ways that he acts in the book of Jonah. So chapter 2, what we get to hear is really what happens between verses 15 and 17 in chapter 1. Between when he was thrown into the raging sea and when he was vomited out onto dry land after three days and nights. We're going to kind of hear Jonah's perspective of what happened in those moments. And that's important because the whole reason God caused this storm again was to bring him back into conformity with his will. Jonah communicates to us the actions that God might take to bring us back into his will. So in chapter 2, here's what we're going to be looking at. Two scenes that highlight God's intentions in our spiritual chastening. I used that word last time. Remember, chastening just simply is a different word for discipline. God's reproof, God's discipline, his chastening. What are God's intentions in disciplining us? As I've already said, it's to bring us back to him. God's sovereign orchestration of events, they all work together to bring this heartfelt repentance for his children. So again, two scenes that highlight God's intentions in our spiritual chastening. And the first is really found in the first seven verses of chapter 2. And that is desperate prayer yields divine deliverance. In the first seven verses of chapter 2, we see desperate prayer and we see divine deliverance in the case of Jonah. Now he's allowing, God is allowing deep suffering something we've all at one point experienced to drive Jonah to call out to him. And in these first seven verses, it is just a line by line, verse by verse, recalling of God's attentive ear, God's listening ear, literally in the deepest of suffering. So, Before we dive in, let's just get a picture in our minds of what's going on. I want you to know where Jonah is, what's going on. So if you think about this, chapter 2 is a prayer within a prayer. This is not a prayer of deliverance. This is prayer post-deliverance. He's looking back on answered prayer, and he's praying to God and thanking God for the fact that he answered his prayer. And the interesting part is Jonah is not even out of the woods yet. He's still in the the whale or the fish. So it says in verse 1, he called out to the Lord. He prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. Now, most of us, if we were in the stomach of a fish, I think we would have to admit that's the point where we would cry out to God. God, rescue me from this fish. But Jonah is still in the fish and he's crying out, thanking God from the bowels of a fish, and he's thanking God for his deliverance. This likely just goes to show how bad his previous predicament in the ocean must have been. Jonah is just, at this point, happy to be alive. So from the belly of the fish, Jonah starts out in verse 2. He said, I called out of my distress to the Lord. This is the first of four times in these verses Jonah says that he prayed. He cried out to the Lord. This is the first time in the book of Jonah where Jonah seems to even care about what God thinks or even turn his attention towards God. All he's done so far is run from God until he's in this situation. He calls out 
And notice why. Why exactly was he crying out? It says, distress, out of my distress, out of this moment of my soul is distressed. I don't know what to do. But he cries out. The, the word for distress is literally out of my need, out of my anxiety. Great emotional distress causes Jonah to cry out to God. And of course, had we been in Jonah's shoes, we would have too. Tossed into a raging sea, near death as we see in a few verses. And Jonah's knee-jerk response to his circumstances is to not give up but to pray. And once he does that, once he calls out to God, God answers. That's what it says in the last part of verse 2. I cried for help. From the depth of Sheol, you heard my voice. And it's interesting, when you read the original Hebrew of this, it, it sort of puts the emphasis on where he's at. He says it sort of like this. From the depths of Sheol, I cried for help and you answered me. From there, I cried out. All the way from the depths of Sheol. Sheol, as some of you may know, is the word that Hebrews would use to describe where souls that departed from the earth went. It's essentially where the dead went. Jonah essentially says, look, I was almost dead. I was right there at death's door. I was basically in Sheol. And in the 11th hour, I cried out for help and God heard my voice. Desperate prayer yields divine deliverance. And he was right. God answered him. And then I love, as you go on in verse 3, listen to his acknowledgement. Think of this as an acknowledgement here. He says, for you, talking to God, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. He's praying to the same God who threw him in. Now, we do know that the sailors threw him in. We know that it was somewhat voluntary. But he acknowledges this is God's sovereign hand over this situation. God sovereignly orchestrated these events. He says, you threw me in. You cast me into the deep. And he knows God is disciplining him. He knew God was after him in chapter 1. He knew he was disobeying. And here he says, I know you're disciplining me. Earlier in chapter 1, the text says that he knew the storm was because of God's displeasure. And so you know the whole time Jonah is in the water, in the raging sea, and he's about to drown, you know that he knows God is not happy with him. He knows that it's divine displeasure. God is on every side of this situation, and Jonah knows it. God is the one who casted Jonah in. He is the one who got Jonah out eventually. He is the one Jonah cried out to, and he is the one who delivered Jonah. Jonah is the one who praises God in the end. And this is essentially what Jonah is recognizing here, that in his deepest of suffering, God's mighty hand, God's sovereign hand, is still over even that. Look at verse 4. He's saying, I have, he said, during the suffering, so I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Jonah knows this isn't bad circumstance. This isn't unfortunate events. This isn't a series of unfortunate events. This is divine displeasure. I've been expelled from God's sight. He has broken fellowship with his God. And let me just say, not all suffering that you and I experience, not all suffering is due to God punishing us for our individual sin or disciplining us or chastening us for our individual sin. There are many reasons why people may suffer and 
Yes, Romans 8, 28, it's true. All things work together for the good of those who are God's children. All suffering is for our good and has been always for our good. But that is not the case here. It's not just suffering in general here. Jonah knows this is my sin that has caused this and brought it on. I mean, can you honestly imagine coming to the realization that you have been expelled from God's sight? And in one sense, isn't this Jonah just getting whatever he, what, what he was wanting in the beginning? He was wanting to flee the presence of the Lord. And this is God just saying, okay, I will expel you from my sight. Jonah knows it. Yeah, I've, I love the next word. Jonah says, in his, says to himself, I've been expelled from your sight, nevertheless. So, God, I know what I did. I know you're angry with me. I know you've cast me away, but you're the only one I can turn to. So I still call out to you. Maybe you're still compassionate. Maybe you will still hear me. Maybe I still have time. I've been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again towards your holy temple. According to Psalm 11, your holy temple, God's holy temple is heaven, in heaven. Nevertheless, I will look, in other words, I will look to God. I will look to you who can save me. And then verses 5 through 7, the suffering just intensifies. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. This guy's not in a good position. Verse 6, I descended to the roots of the mountains, basically just saying, I'm, I'm way deep in the water. The earth with its bars was around me forever as far as I can see, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. So there's just more description here. It says, verse 7, while I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord. I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. So it's just more description of Jonah's miserable situation. situation. So just when you're reading Jonah, if you were reading Jonah for the first time, you would think this Jonah character, surely God's done with him. Surely God's run out of patience with him. God's ready to get another prophet who's more willing to obey and God's ready to let him perish. While you're thinking all those things, God extends his hand to Jonah. Now, I, I think it would be appropriate to mention a few things. And maybe you've noticed, if you have any familiarity with the Psalms, maybe you've noticed that many of these verses in Jonah chapter 2 line up pretty close to many of the Psalms that, that we have in our Bible. Stay in Jonah, but let me just read to you a few verses from the Psalter. I pretty closely match what Jonah's prayer is here. Let me read you Psalm 18, 4 through 6. The cords of death encompassed me, and the torrents of ungodliness terrified me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God for help. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry for help before him came into his ears. Psalm 116, the, the cords of death encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. I found distress and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech you, save my life. And then one more, Psalm 42, verses 6 and 7. O oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I remember you. From the land of the Jordan, deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have rolled over me. And those are only three. There are numerous, it seems in Jonah chapter 2, numerous allusions to the Psalms. To the Psalm book of Israel. Now, I don't think that Jonah was sitting there with, uh, with a scroll open in the belly of the fish. I doubt he had that with him. But what you see bleeding through his prayer is 
God's own words in the psalm book. He had God's word in his mind before he was in the deepest of suffering. And since it was in his mind, he could pray God's word back to God. So for all of his foibles, Jonah provides really a great example of having God's word in his head. He has scripture stored up in his mind for such a crisis as this. This is crucial for us as well. Furnish your mind now with God's word so that when you meet the deepest of affliction, you have something to turn to. You have something, you have words to use to pray to God. Again, in verse 7, he says, I remember the Lord. What, what exactly was he remembering the Lord? It doesn't say, but it does say what he did. His reaction, his knee-jerk reaction was to pray. And I think Jonah was probably remembering sort of the same thing as it says in Psalm 46.1, that God is our refuge and our strength, the very present help in trouble. Jonah was able to call upon his theology and distress. He was able to remember the character of God. And the most beautiful part of this story is God's compassion on him to get him exactly where he wants him. God's work in this, his orchestration of events, is all in an effort to get Jonah right where he wants him. And that's dependent on his knees, coming back to God. And of course, we know God heard his prayer. God was a very present help in trouble. That's the point of a section of these verses. God hears desperate pleas. Of course, you may be like Jonah. Right now, running from God, knowing you're in disobedience to God, Maybe you're in Jonah's shoes, and maybe you need to hear that if you've been running from God and God has placed you under his discipline, his hand of discipline, that you need to do what Jonah does here and run back to God. And now, maybe you're just in any suffering. Maybe this isn't the Lord's discipline on your life, but maybe you are in suffering. I know there are some in here who are in suffering. And maybe you just need a reminder that God is, for his children, a ready help. Waiting for your call out to him. I don't, why are we so dependent on ourselves in these situations? As Christians, we have a God who is omnipotent, omniscient, ready to help. And we are so self-dependent in those moments. It's just Pride. Jonah exemplifies something here that we must all take to heart. God is one prayer away. He is a ready help in the time of distress. So first, we see God answering Jonah's desperate pleas. The first scene we see here is desperate prayer. Jonah's desperate prayer yields divine deliverance. And God so compassionately causes Jonah to run back to him. This is really, I'll just say this, and, and maybe um, you know how the rest of the story plays out with Jonah. He still questions God. He eventually obeys. Spoiler alert, he goes to Nineveh. He eventually obeys, but he still has some issues that he's solving in his heart, and God still calls him out at the very last chapter. So you know how the book ends, and you know how it started. Jonah doesn't really look good on either side of chapter 2. But I do think that this is really Jonah's best moment in chapter 2 because he knows that God would rescue him. He calls out to God. Even in the midst of his own self-inflicted sin, Jonah calls out, to God and God rescues him. So divine, sorry, desperate prayer yields divine deliverance in scene one. But starting in verse 
8, we see that divine, divine deliverance yields thankful praise. So verses 8 through 10, divine deliverance also yields thankful praise. After Jonah's miraculous deliverance from the fierce Mediterranean Sea, we see a, really a new side of Jonah emerge. Jonah now is looking from what God did to what he will do, from what God did to who God is. And the essence of Jonah's response is thankfulness and repentance. Again, this is really where Jonah peaks in this book. So he looks back on his answered prayer and deliverance. And what you're going to see in verses 8 through 10 is he's going to start making some really theological affirmations and recommitments to God. That's what you're going to see in verses 8 through 10. God sometimes, oftentimes, puts his rebellious children in trying and possible circumstances for this sole purpose to get praise from them. And he delivers them to get praise from them so that they would be realigned with his will. That's what God's doing in suffering. So you see the process here. This traumatic experience of Jonah's and his miraculous deliverance put Jonah's heart back on track. So Jonah, in verse 8, still praying says, those who regard, look with me at verse 8, those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness. Now, what it seems like here is Jonah's just kind of turning from, thank you, God, thank you, God, you answered my prayer. I was in deep, deep suffering, and you answered me, thank you. But all those who regard vain idols, uh, they forsake their faithfulness. Some take it that, that way, but is what I think he's doing here. He's not just randomly calling out idolaters. I think he's trying to express his heart. Jonah is trying to best express his own heart and reaffirm his own commitment to the fact that God is the only faithful God. To pay regard to literally vain worthlessness, that's what it literally is here, vain worthlessness, these idols, to pay regard to them is to forsake this God who is faithful. The same one that Jonah forsaked. Of course, that word faithful, faithfulness, is the well-known Hebrew term, hesed, which is sort of a work, workhorse term. Essentially just means faithfulness, loving kindness, steadfast love. And so Jonah had to experience God expelling him from his presence, he had to experience God's chastening hand to realize this. And through this experience, Jonah has gained a new clarity about who God is and a new commitment to him. But not only does Jonah just have theological clarity, but he starts realigning his ways to Yahweh, his God. Verse 9, but I will sacrifice to you. So I will sacrifice to you, how? With a voice of thanksgiving. Now, without going on a full-fledged description, doctrinal treatise on what sacrifices, Old Testament sacrifices were, it would be appropriate to kind of just point out that sacrifices were a God-ordained practice in the Old Testament. He, he did tell his people to, to sacrifice. It was a prescribed practice of worship. Of course, the problem is when people offer sacrifices without something behind their offering. Offering sacrifices without a right heart was virtually meaningless to God. He didn't care just about sacrifices for the sake of sacrifices, worship practices for the sake of worship practices. If the heart is not in it, God doesn't want it. That's just external behavior. 
And the message here is there is a way to go about doing religious external acts that God is not pleased with in the least. Flip over to, just, just briefly, just one book over to the book of Micah. Go to Micah chapter 6. We actually talked about this in our uh, high school and junior high Sunday school. Micah chapter 6 has essentially the same point. Micah 6, verses 6 through 8. It says in verse 6, with what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He's, you see the escalation here in degrees. And then verse 8, He has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. You see, just doing these external things without a heart of worship behind them, without a heart of thanksgiving and humbleness. That's just dangerous, and it does not please God. We can do that today. That's the tragedy of many churches that we see across our nation and across the world. It's what everyone can slip into, that we come and we do these sort of external things because we just do them and there's nothing behind them. There's not a heart of praise behind them. There's no thankfulness. We can just go through the motions, and that's just externalism. It shows up as us just sitting in service because that's what we do every week. And we go to church because it's what we do every week. It's singing songs because that's what you're supposed to do at church. God's not pleased with that. I love the Simplicity with which uh, Tom Pennington puts it. He says, God is not satisfied when your body shows up. God is not satisfied just showing with you showing up to church. Now, we are commanded to come to church. Don't get me wrong. That is an act of obedience. But God's not satisfied with just you being here. Church, the primary reason that we gather every week is not to be entertained by a good sermon or to sing feel-good songs or check a religious box, but we're here to praise God like Jonah with thankful hearts. Thankful hearts. That's what drives our worship. That's what drives everything we do here. One of my professors says, worship is the reflex of the redeemed heart. Worship is the reflex of you being redeemed. Think about Moses. Think about Moses after they went through the Red Sea. First thing he did was sing. He was delivered. The first thing he does is sing a song. He's thankful. And so as we gather every week, know that we are here to worship God because we have been delivered from nothing physical necessarily, but spiritually delivered if you're in Christ. There's nothing greater than that. That's what compels our worship. That's what motivates every song that we sing. That's why we show up to church and do what we do. So let that be your heart as you come each week. And then Jonah continues, that which I vowed I will pay. Again, very similar language if you know Psalm 116. Psalm 116 says, To you I shall offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and call upon the name of the Lord. I shall pay my vows to the Lord. And we don't know the specifics of what Jonah vowed to God, but we can imagine that it was likely something like, God, if you get me out of this situation, I will go to Nineveh. I will obey. And of course he does that. 
And his last statement is what chapter 2 is all working towards. Salvation is from the Lord. Another theological affirmation from Jonah. What Jonah had come to recognize was that God is the only one who could save him. The only one that can truly save is is Yahweh. Maybe a fish was the instrument that God used in that. Maybe that was the medium by which he was delivered. But God himself was the one who delivered Jonah. And of course, this is true in all respects. Jonah is talking about physical deliverance here. But spiritual deliverance, you see this same theme play out. That salvation, period, whether physical or spiritual, is from God. And all those who've placed their faith in Christ, they know that to be true. They know that to be true. And then verse 10 kind of ties a bow on it. Then the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up on dry land. So don't you see that through Jonah's suffering, God corrected both Jonah's perspective, both his, the lens with which he viewed God, and also his conduct, his perspective and his practice. And this is exactly why the Bible, when it speaks of God's discipline, looks fondly on it. Do not despise the discipline of the Lord. Why? Because it is the rod by which God both corrects our behavior and adjusts our loyalties. Remember Psalm 119, before I was afflicted, I went astray. So before I was in this, the cellar of affliction, before that, I went astray. But now I keep your word. And then a few verses later, just as good. It is good for me that I was afflicted. I was afflicted. That was good. Why? That I may learn your statutes. Who in their right mind calls affliction good but those who have been trained by it? And if nothing else stands out to you today, you just need to realize that if you are a child of God, God loves you too much to let you continue on in unchecked sin. To let you continue to run from him. Again, I started off everything in Jonah by stating that the main theme of the book of Jonah is God's compassion. And I think we can all Acknowledge that God is compassion. I want to make clear, I don't believe Jonah is an allegory. I don't think anyone here believes Jonah is just a story that is told to illustrate a purpose or a point. This is a real story. It's not a fabrication that stands for some deeper spiritual truth, but there is a parallel here that we should notice between Jonah's physical deliverance and our spiritual. I've already alluded to this once. But Jonah was in physically dire circumstances. And Christians, weren't we in spiritually dire circumstances prior to Christ? Jonah was physically close to death. We, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, we were not just close to death, not sort of alive, but we were dead in our trespasses and sins. In fact, far more serious than being in physical peril is being in spiritual peril. And all who are not in Christ are indeed in great spiritual peril. You should be more afraid of the spiritual dangers of neglecting, the spiritual neglecting of God then Jonah was afraid in the ocean. Jonah calling out to God is what we must do. 
If you think, again, that Jonah had good reason for panicking, you have better reason if you don't place your faith in Christ. All those who have sinned, it says the wages of sin, what you get paid for sin, like you go to a job and you get a wage, you get, you get paid for your labor, you know what you get paid for sin? Death. That's serious. But what's true is that just as Jonah called upon the Lord, the unsaved person has the opportunity today to call upon the name of Jesus Christ to be saved. God's means of deliverance. You can be spiritually rescued from the coming wrath of God that is owed to you because of your sin. And the way of spiritual deliverance is through trusting in Christ for salvation, calling out to him in genuine repentance. But one must call out to God to experience this precious salvation, and God will hear that desperate cry for rescue, just as he did for Jonah in Jonah chapter 2. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that by your word, your servant is warned. We thank you that we know a compassionate God by reading Jonah. Lord, you are nothing but good to Jonah. You're nothing but good to us. And though we may stray, though we may try to continue on in sin and run from you, your goodness and your kindness, your faithfulness compels you to, to deliver us, to, to bring us back to you. So, Father, I pray that by our study of Jonah that you would stir hearts to worship you for your compassion. It's in your name that I pray. Amen.